Tonight, states of emergency as a deadly winter storm marches east with blizzard conditions and possible tornadoes. The system barreling through the middle of the country at this hour, bringing heavy snow, rain, and high winds, making travel extremely dangerous. Residents in Amarillo, Texas, asked to shelter in place. 135 million Americans on alert for high winds that could knock power out amid freezing temperatures. We're also keeping a close eye on the Gulf Coast. Residents from Texas to Florida could see those potentially life-threatening nocturnal tornadoes. And now the Northeast bracing for widespread flooding as they clean up from this weekend storm. Bill Karen standing by. Also breaking tonight, the explosion at a hotel in downtown Fort Worth. Aerial footage shows windows blown out on the building's first two floors. Nearly a dozen people rushed to the hospital. What may have caused this blast? Danger in the air, the investigation into how part of an Alaska Airlines plane blew off mid-flight. The door plug from the 737 MAX 9 recovered today in a person's backyard. The other major U.S. airline now reporting it also found loose bolts. Who's in command? Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin hospitalized for more than a week, but no one, including the president or his own staff, knew for days. So what happened? And who's in charge of our military? We're live at the Pentagon with new reporting. Countdown to Iowa with just one week left until the Iowa caucus. GOP presidential hopefuls making their final pitch to voters. But frontrunner, former President Trump, not expected in the Hawkeye state until this weekend. Governor Ron DeSantis ramping up his attacks against his opponents. Meanwhile, Nikki Haley forced to cancel an event this weekend. What she says is the reason. And wait till you hear the forecast on caucus day. Plus, we'll show you the incredible rescue, the driver ending up at the bottom of a cliff and then trapped in her car with no cell service in frigid temperatures. How she was finally rescued after five days. And meet the super commuter, a man who tried living in Columbus, Ohio, but but working in person in New York City to save money and live the life he wants. So does he love it or is he ready to leave it? His tips on how everyone can save on hotels and flights. Top story starts right now. And good evening. We begin with that massive winter storm on the move as we come on the air. Nearly half the country under some type of weather alert. Take a look at this. It's a video out of Oakley, Kansas. Whiteout conditions causing a nightmare on the roads there. In Amarillo, Texas, residents told to shelter in place. Major roadways closed and officials responding to stranded drivers. But as you can see, the storm is now moving east and snow is not the only major concern. 14 million people from Texas to Florida at risk for hail, damaging winds, and tornadoes. That would be striking at night, making them even more dangerous. And tomorrow, downpours expected all along the East Coast with major flooding risks from the Mid-Atlantic to New England in areas that just got hit with snow. New Jersey has already declared a state of emergency. You see people here getting those sandbags. Travel advisories launched in New York. Bill Cairns will time it all out for us in just a moment. But we want to begin tonight with Kathy Park, live in Massachusetts. Just completely zero visibility. Tonight, a dangerous blizzard intensifying over the Great Plains, dumping heavy snow from New Mexico to Iowa, making travel next to impossible, even stranding semis. In Nebraska, conditions quickly deteriorating, with visibility reduced to less than a mile. As a storm advances toward the Midwest, two inches of snow could fall per hour, with wind speeds nearing hurricane force levels. Oh my God. To the south, much of the Gulf Coast on high alert for tornadoes. Schools in the danger zone closing early ahead of the threat. Fort Lauderdale recovering from a weekend tornado touching down and traveling for over a mile. Houston bracing for heavy winds ahead of the college football championships tonight. Meanwhile, the Northeast is digging out from its first major winter storm of the year. What do you think about all the snow that we got? Oh, that's too much. Worcester, Massachusetts buried in over a foot of snow. Parts of Pennsylvania seeing 15 inches. And now heavy rain threatening the region. New Jersey declaring a state of emergency ahead of the storm. This is one I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage folks to not uh, underestimate. 
All right, Kathy Park joins us now live from Worcester, Massachusetts. We see that snow pile there just behind you, Kathy. We understand these storms have now turned fatal with at least one person dead. Tom, that's exactly right. We are learning that early this morning, according to the Dawson County Sheriff's Office in Nebraska, a car, a driver was traveling along Highway 30, lost control, and then crossed into the wrong lane, crashing into another car. One person was killed, and officials are saying that the weather played a factor in this crash. Meanwhile, here in Worcester and throughout New England, flooding is a big concern by midweek. Several inches of rain is expected in this region Tuesday night into Wednesday. Tom? Okay, Kathy Park leading us off tonight for more on these dangerous storm threats. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins me now live in studio. So Bill, walk us through this and what areas are you most concerned about? Well, we'll start tonight with the tornado threat because that's life-threatening, can destroy a town. That's going to happen during the overnight hour, so make sure you pay attention, have your phone on, have any emergency device that you have, uh, weather radio. That's from the Houston area all the way to New Orleans. So this is that line of storms that will move through through the night. It'll be with us right during the day tomorrow, too. We've only had one confirmed tornado so far, but through the night, this area is the best chance. It's right along I-10. It doesn't even go up that far into Alabama or Mississippi. It's right along the Florida Panhandle Mobile. Biloxi, uh, Bay St. Louis area, and then tomorrow we take it up through the Carolinas. Then the flooding. We already have a flash flood warning, a couple of them in and around the southern Louisiana outside of New Orleans. Tomorrow, that flood threat goes right up the mid-Atlantic, 79 million people in this. The areas that just saw the snowstorm, almost all that snow is going to melt. We're going to get a tremendous amount of rain tomorrow night at this time in areas of New Jersey and southern New England. Along with that snow melt, we're going to have some pretty serious flooding of the rivers, plus at the high tide, coastal flooding on top of that with beach erosion. The power outages, it wouldn't surprise me if we get into the millions with this storm. This is like a winter hurricane. The max wind gusts throughout almost everywhere east of the Rockies is going to be from 30 to 60 mile per hour winds. And that's going to cause a lot of downed trees. That's going to cause power outages. Here's the power outage forecast just in the northeast. Anywhere in orange is scattered where you see the red. And on top of all of this, you already mentioned it. We have this blizzard ongoing. Tom, we have people trapped in western Kansas waiting to be rescued in their vehicles. And the emergency responders can't get there right now. I mean, this is just one of the most high impact storms we've had in a long time. Besides a hurricane making landfall, this is probably, you know, second to worst. Bill, I think you said it best, a winter hurricane. I know it's going to be a busy week for you and the weather team. We're going to stay on top of this throughout the broadcast as well. Bill, thank you for that. We want to turn to some other breaking news tonight. An explosion at a hotel in Fort Worth, Texas, injuring at least 11 people, forcing nearby businesses to shut down. You can see it right here as emergency crews investigate and try to secure the scene. For more on these late-breaking details, I'm joined live by NBC's Dana Griffin. Dana, what's the latest, and do we know yet what caused this massive explosion? Hey, Tom, so this happened around 3.30 p.m. local time. The fire department says that this was an explosion. They've also noted that there is a smell of gas still in that area. It's unclear if this was an explosion and then the gas leak happened afterward or if this happened before. That is something that they are looking into Right now, they have cordoned off the area. They are asking people to stay away from this hotel. But as you can see, there is at least two floors. That first and second floor windows are blown out, sending glass and debris into the street. So right now, they are still investigating this cause. Uh, it's still unclear exactly how many people were inside that hotel, Tom, at the time of this explosion. And Dana, we're hearing early reports of about 11 people that were rushed to the hospital. Do we have any other further reporting on that? Yeah, so 11 people total were injured. There was one person missing. That person has been found. Uh, they say nine people were taken to the hospital. One is considered in critical condition. Two are considered serious condition. The rest of the injuries are considered minor, uh, but obviously still a very traumatic thing for a lot of people. Several witnesses said that they felt that jolt when that explosion happened. So hopefully there are no additional injuries Tom? Yeah, a wild scene there in Fort Worth. Okay, Dana Griffin for us. Dana, we thank you for that. Now to the investigation to that frightening incident on board an Alaska Airlines flight over the weekend. A door plug blew off the plane at 60,000, 16,000 feet. NTSB officials have recovered that fallen part from someone's backyard. Tom Costello has the latest on this investigation. Breaking tonight, United Airlines reports it has found loose bolts and some of its 737 MAX 9 door plugs as both United and Alaska Airlines conduct FAA-ordered inspections on all MAX 9s in the U.S. 
Earlier today, the NTSB recovered the missing 63-pound door plug that blew out of the side of that Alaska Airlines MAX 9 Friday night, landing in a teacher's backyard. The plug will undergo a close inspection at the NTSB lab in Washington as investigators look at how and why the plane suffered a decompression explosion at 16,000 feet. Alaska. While no one was seated in the nearest seats, those seats were left twisted and bent. The headrests and cushions sucked out of the plane, along with clothing and cell phones. Nicholas Hoke was on board the plane. I was starting to text my my girlfriend, my my mom, my other loved ones, and um, didn't know if I was going to make it on the other side. It was a uh, a lot of intense emotions, for sure. The door plug that failed is held in place by bolts and pins used to seal an extra emergency exit if airlines don't need it. The NTSB says on three previous flights, pressurization warning lights lit up in the same plane. Yet Alaska only restricted the plane from flying over water to Hawaii until technicians could evaluate the problem. It's early, but should Alaska have grounded the plane back then? Certainly, it should have it's been a warning sign to them, for just on safety overall. But I think, you know, in this case, uh, what Alaska will say is that they took measures uh, to ensure safety. We have to see whether uh, those actions uh, were responsive or not enough. The plane's fuselage is made for Boeing by Wichita-based Spirit Aerosystems. Today, Spirit said our primary focus is the quality and product integrity of the aircraft structures we deliver. Boeing today issued inspection guidelines for every airline that flies the MAX 9. As the FAA reiterated, the MAX 9s will remain grounded until airlines complete enhanced inspections, which include both left and right cabin door exit plugs. That takes four to eight hours each. Corrective actions must be completed before any plane returns to service. Meanwhile, Boeing's CEO has called a company-wide Tuesday meeting to focus on safety. This MAX 9 emergency comes after two fatal MAX 8 crashes that grounded the plane, loose bolts on the MAX rudder system, production and quality control delays with the MAX 8, the 787, military planes, and Boeing's space program. Even an incident like this that doesn't involve any injuries or fatalities does serve to undermine, to some degree, the confidence in Boeing's ability to manufacture a safe aircraft. Alaska and United have canceled more than 300 flights again today. They'll continue canceling flights tomorrow. By the way, also, the black boxes have a problem. The cockpit voice recorder is on a two-hour loop before it's erased and recorded over. And that's what happened. Investigators can't listen to the crew conversations, computer warnings, the air rushing through the cabin. It's a very big reason, Tom, why investigators have called for 25-hour recordings not two hours. Back to you. Tom Costello with a lot of reporting there. Tom, we thank you for that. We want to head overseas now to what Israel is calling a new phase of its war against Hamas. As military leaders signal plans to scale back attacks, our Raf Sanchez went inside Gaza with Israeli troops and has a firsthand look at what they are calling the largest rocket-making facility uncovered so far. Tonight, Secretary Blinken touching down in Israel on a high-stakes diplomatic trip aimed at stopping the war in Gaza spreading across the Middle East. I will press on the absolute imperative to do more to protect civilians. But hours before his arrival, fighting escalating between Israel and Hezbollah. The Iranian-backed militant group saying one of its commanders killed by a strike in southern Lebanon. Israel not officially taking responsibility, but the air raid appears to be a response to a Hezbollah attack on an Israeli radar system over the weekend. Blinken also hoping to ease the spiraling humanitarian crisis in Gaza, where nearly two million people have been driven from their homes and food is desperately scarce. Israel's military indicating it may be scaling back its attacks after weeks of U.S. pressure telling The New York Times the war shifted a stage. Earlier today, we headed into Gaza with Israeli troops. The sounds of battle still raging. You can hear that fighting going on right now. We arrived in an area of the Central Strip that Israel says is the hidden source of many of Hamas's rockets. 
The Israeli military says it blasted through this door at a farmhouse and it discovered in this basement a tunnel, which it says if you follow far enough will take you to a Hamas rocket and missile manufacturing facility. The military would not take us into the tunnels, saying there were dangerous explosives inside, but says this is the largest Hamas weapons production site discovered so far. We do not understand the size and the extent of this terror factory. A series of interconnected production hubs below and above ground, including what was once a factory for steel casings. It now allegedly used by Hamas to make mortars based on American designs. It's called, yeah, mortar shell. And in a nearby warehouse, what the IDF says are Hamas's crown jewels. 100 kilometer rockets, the rockets that were firing to Tel Aviv. Some of those rockets lighting up the skies again tonight. Each wail of the siren a reminder that Hamas is far from defeated. Many Israelis are asking, how is it three months into this war, Hamas is still able to fire rockets on Israeli cities? Hamas is keeping a small amount of, uh, of rockets to maintain his uh, economy of war. But you'll see, you're now seeing since the beginning of the war, the number have dropped. We saw no Palestinian civilians, but a few miles away, thousands mourning two Gazan journalists killed by an Israeli strike. One of them, Hamza al-Dadua, the son of Al Jazeera's bureau chief Wa'el al-Dadua, the veteran journalist holding his remaining family close, having already lost his wife, two children, and a grandchild in an earlier strike. Israel initially claimed Hamza was in a car with a terrorist flying a drone. Now suggesting their journalist drone may have led to them being mistakenly targeted. Using a drone in a war zone, it's a problem. It looks like the terrorists because what we see with Hamas, that Hamas uses drones. Another bloody reminder that in Gaza, no one is safe. Simply terrible for that family there in Gaza. Raf Sanchez joins us tonight from Tel Aviv. Raf, we've now seen two major Israeli airstrikes into Lebanon, hitting high-value targets in the last week. First, the attack that killed a senior Hamas official in Beirut, and now this attack that you mentioned, killing a senior Hezbollah commander. What is Lebanon saying about these strikes? I mean, is the footprint of the Israeli invasion now expanding? Well, Tom, the Lebanese government is basically powerless to stop this escalation between Israel and Hezbollah. The Lebanese government has far less firepower than Hezbollah. And we heard the foreign minister basically saying Hezbollah will decide whether it's going to retaliate at what scale, and Lebanon will basically find out alongside with them. In terms of the Lebanese people, there is a lot of concern. There's strong anti-Israel feeling in Lebanon, given Israel's bloody history in that country. And at the same time, with the dire economic crisis that Lebanese have been going through in recent years, the feeling is the last thing they need is a full-scale war. Tom. Raf Sanchez from Tel Aviv tonight. Raf, we thank you for that. We want to turn now to the torrent of backlash facing Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin after he spent four days in the ICU without seeming to notify the Pentagon. President Biden today not answering questions about his confidence in Austin. Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby has this story. Tonight, the White House says President Biden has complete confidence in his defense secretary, Lloyd Austin. Even after revelations, Austin was hospitalized in intensive care for several days and was unable to perform his job and hid it from the commander in chief. The president not answering questions today. It began Monday, January 1st, when the Pentagon says Austin was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance for complications following a recent elective medical procedure. Two senior administration officials say he spent at least four days in the ICU, but no one told the White House, nor Austin's deputy, Kathleen Hicks, until Thursday, January 4th. The Pentagon says Hicks, who was on vacation in Puerto Rico, was given certain operational responsibilities on Tuesday, but was not told why. The Pentagon waited until Friday to tell the public about Austin's absence. Tonight, the Pentagon refusing to describe his medical issue, citing privacy. The defense secretary is a critical member of the president's National Security Council, which can be called upon at a moment's notice during an urgent military crisis, like an imminent attack. 
In Austin's mystery absence happening during a time of rising Mideast tensions, with U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria attacked at least 14 times during his hospitalization, and Houthi rebels continuing to target ships in the Red Sea. Republicans say Austin broke the law and needs to go. Republican frontrunner Donald Trump writing, failed Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin should be fired immediately for improper professional conduct and dereliction of duty. It raises questions about Joe Biden's competence and whether he's really in charge at the White House. This is a shocking breakdown in the chain of command. Tonight, Austin is still in the hospital. This weekend, writing, I recognize I could have done a better job ensuring the public was appropriately informed. I take full responsibility for my decisions about disclosure. Okay, Courtney QB joins us now live from the Pentagon. And Courtney, I know you have some new reporting for us. Yeah, that's right. We, uh, so we know that Secretary Austin is still in the hospital. He's out at ICU. He's been out now for some time. Um, but we still don't know, according to a statement released from the press secretary, Major General Pat Ryder, we still don't know when Secretary Austin could be released. They're not putting any time frame on it. He is, according to General Ryder, in good spirits. His condition is good. But again, we still have no details about what the original elective medical procedure was that started all of this or what the secretary's condition is right now. And Tom, why that's so critical is we have no sense right now if this is something that could impact the secretary and his and continuing to, to do his, his job here and carry out his responsibilities, things like travel. We don't know if that could still be affected for weeks or even months to come. Yeah, there's still a lot of questions. I, I think what's most troubling is the first part of your story, which you reported, essentially saying that the president of the United States says he still has full confidence in the secretary of defense even though the White House was left in the dark about his condition for days. What is your understanding what's at play here and, and, and how the White House could say, how could both those things be true? Yeah, it, and it's not just that the, the the Pentagon didn't notify the White House, but when the when Secretary uh, Austin's condition worsened about a day after he got to Walter Reed, so January second, the there's a normal procedure where his deputy Kathleen Hicks is notified that she's going to assume some of the, some of the responsibilities. She was not notified why, and she was on vacation in Puerto Rico at the time. Once she was told two days later that she was going to be uh, she was assuming these responsibilities because he was in. ICU at the hospital, she immediately started making plans to return to D.C. She understood the urgency of the situation. So that just underscores how not letting anyone know for days, there really was an urgent situation here. So back to your question, Secretary, uh, President Biden has said he will not fire Secretary Austin uh, through his press secretary. Secretary Austin has said he does not plan to resign. But the reality here, Tom, is if this situation continues to be a firestorm like it is right now, for days or even weeks, if there are, are hill, um, there are hearings on the Hill and there continue to be calls for him to resign, the White House may have to re-examine the situation. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that point, and I think we're just starting to learn everything that's involved with this case as well. All right, Courtney Q. Courtney, thank you for all that reporting. We want to turn to politics now and the race to finish in Iowa, where the GOP field is now just one week out from the first in the nation caucus. Former President Trump under fire from his Republican rivals and President Biden. Garrett Haig has more on how Hawkeye state voters are reacting. Tonight, one week until Iowa formally kicks off the 2024 presidential campaign. Republican candidates targeting the overwhelming favorite frontrunner Donald Trump. He was really good at breaking things. He just wasn't good at fixing them. Today, President Biden also taking aim, slamming Mr. Trump and his supporters for downplaying January 6th. The MAGA Republicans, led by a defeated president, is trying to steal history now, telling us that violent mob was, and I quote, a peaceful protest. Mr. Trump recently attacking President Biden, saying the president is trying to distract from his record by fear-mongering over January 6th, falsely labeling those convicted of crimes connected to the attack as hostages. They ought to release the J6 hostages they've suffered enough. The Republican frontrunner preparing to attend a court hearing in his election interference case tomorrow. Mr. Trump accusing the president of weaponizing the DOJ against him. A view rallying both his supporters here when they are indicting him, we are being indicted. And even voters like Melissa Nobles, who plans to support a different Republican candidate. So you think it's all purely political? Oh, it's just it's just to keep him out of uh, from running. And um, that's crap. I mean, I may not like the guy, may never voted for him, 
but he has the right to run. And with that, Garrett Haig joins us tonight from the campaign trail in Des Moines, Iowa. Garrett, we know we can see it there. The weather is already starting to affect the campaign this week. Snow coming down in Iowa today, hampering some campaign travel. And I understand we're also getting an early look at the forecast for the caucus day next Monday. What, what do we know so far? Yeah, Tom, the weather is always a factor in Iowa, it seems, and today was no exception. We had one candidate event uh, for Nikki Haley this morning and a surrogate event tonight for Donald Trump canceled because of this storm. We're expecting six to ten inches here uh, in Des Moines overnight, so we could see more co complications tomorrow. Caucus day itself, negative 13 degrees is the low, but the high could get all the way up to four, so it may be kind of balmy. All kidding aside, the cold could affect turnout. It's always a guessing game who benefits and who loses in that scenario. Just another factor for these campaigns to take into account as we get a little bit closer, Tom. That's going to be a long day for the candidates, the voters, and all the reporters. All right, Gary, thank you for that. For more on the state of the race in Iowa, let's check in with our team of campaign embeds following all the major candidates over every mile across the battleground states and especially in Iowa. We begin tonight with our embed on the Trump campaign. Hey there, Tom. Jake Trailer here covering the Trump campaign for NBC News. I'm in Urbandale, Iowa at Trump's state campaign headquarters. As a community not too far from where I'm standing mourns the loss of a sixth grade student in a school shooting last Thursday, Trump is facing criticism for his cavalier comments, advising Iowans it was something they would have to get over. And that, Tom, just one week out from the first in the nation voting here in Iowa. And this build up to the caucus. Candidates are known for crisscrossing the state in a final push for support. But that's not the strategy that we're seeing from Trump. He will host official campaign events on just two days before voting takes place, leaning on surrogates with familiar names like his son, Eric Trump. Now, I spoke with Eric a couple days ago, and he told me point blank. In 2016, the campaign did not know what they were doing, but that they're singing a different tune eight years later. The Trump campaign says they have a robust and improved infrastructure that uniquely targets first-time caucus goers. But Tom, one thing crucial to an organized ground game is a candidate who's actually in the state. But still, consistent polling indicates, absence or not, Trump has a dominant lead. For reporting on a candidate trying to close that gap in the final week, I'll toss it over to my friend, Alec Hernandez. I'm Alec Hernandez here in West Des Moines, Iowa, where notably Ron DeSantis is not. He is back in Florida today where he's getting ready to deliver the state of the state address tomorrow as a part of his day job ahead of the opening of the state legislature in Tallahassee before jetting back to Iowa in this final push ahead of the caucuses. Now, in his absence, Florida First Lady Casey DeSantis and Texas Congressman Chip Roy are out on the trail making their case to voters why her husband should be the next president of the United States. And in these closing days of the first phase of the campaign, what we've been hearing from DeSantis on the campaign trail is a contrasting message between himself and his fellow candidates. One of his go-to lines now on the stump these days is that Donald Trump is running on his own issues, Nikki Haley, in his words, is running on her donors' issues, and the governor is running on the issues of Iowans and everyday Americans. And that pitch is at the core of a new campaign ad that the DeSantis campaign hit the airwaves with today here in the Hawkeye State. Take a listen to a little bit of that. Here's what Wall Street funded Nikki Haley just said in New Hampshire. You know Iowa starts it. You know that you correct it. Haley disparages the caucuses and insults you. Now, we've just got a couple of days left of campaigning here ahead of the Iowa caucuses. And I'm going to throw it to Greg Hyatt, who's been covering the Nikki Haley campaign. I'm Greg Hyatt reporting outside the Iowa Event Center where former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is participating in a primetime town hall this evening. With just one week left until the Iowa caucus, the former U.N. Ambassador is sharpening her attacks against her GOP rivals, including former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, stating that the ads that are currently airing in the state against her are, quote, lies. Inclement weather is already making its presence known here in Iowa, with Governor Haley forced to cancel an event earlier this morning. This comes as Vivek Ramaswamy posted on X that the reason why that event was canceled was due to people not showing up. But the reason why is Governor Haley was not able to travel from Des Moines due to the inclement weather that is ongoing. She'll return to the campaign trail officially tomorrow hosting a town hall event, and she's expected to remain in the state through the 15th when voters caucus. Tom, back to you. All right, we thank all of our campaign embeds doing a lot of great work out there. Still ahead tonight, the shocking robbery near L.A. 
L.A., a car ramming through a family-run business, then more than a dozen people ransacked the store, even ripping the cash register out. What was happening nearby that police believe may have been connected? Plus, the catamaran engulfed in flames in South Florida, how the boat operator and their dog narrowly escaped, and the driver plunging off a California cliff while trying to avoid a deer. The moment she was finally rescued after she was trapped inside the wreckage, forget this, five days. Stay with us. Okay, we're back now with the shocking video showing the moment dozens of thieves ransacked a family's food store in Los Angeles. First crashing a car into the building, allowing dozens to enter the store. And days later, the owners are reopening their business, but they say they've lost tens of thousands of dollars. And get this, not one person has been arrested yet. Stephen Romo has the details. Chaos at a California convenience store. Surveillance video showing the moment a Kia SUV slammed through the entrance last week, destroying it before dozens of people rushed inside. The last three days have been so hectic. You know, I've been, I've been sleeping here just because we don't have a, a, a way to see, really secure the building. Some, with their faces covered, seen jumping on the counters, taking stuff off the shelves, even ripping the cash register out. It caused more than $70,000 worth of damage to the family-owned Rubens Bakery and Mexican food store in the city of Compton. It was horrendous. It was, it, it, we felt, I felt angry. You know, I was, I was upset. Law enforcement saying everything from equipment, food, even scratch off lottery tickets were stolen. We have meat scales, meat itself, like items from the, from the business um, as far as groceries. This all unfolded at 3 a.m., according to the sheriff's department, as a so-called street takeover was taking place less than a mile away. I've been caught in one. I've heard them, and they just, it's no good. That's when crowds illegally take over busy intersections, blocking traffic to show off cars, race, and perform dangerous stunts. All before law enforcement can arrive to shut it down. They're blocking the traffic, and it's just a bunch of little kids, you know, I guess unsupervised. For years, the city of Compton has tried to address these takeovers to avoid deaths, serious injuries, and other crimes like this burglary last week. We're looking at everything that, that we can working with the sheriff's department in order for us to try to make sure that we can curtail this. Ruben says his family has kept the bakery going for nearly 48 years. This weekend, they were able to reopen. He says thanks to the help from friends, family, and the community. But as of tonight, no arrests have been made. I could maybe wish that it didn't happen, but I just wanted to be back to how we were, just a small business, serving the community, and you know, help, helping out our neighbors. Stephen Romo joins us now live in studio. Stephen, it's great to see those, that video of them reopening and, and, and the place back to operating as usual. But the video of the break-in and the takeover, it, it just gets you so upset. Why aren't there any arrests? How, how can police not figure this out? Yeah, some of the people in that video actually had masks on, so police pointing to that. But they also say they need help from the public to try to find these people and get them uh, under charges or to face a backlash for what they're actually dealing with. They are also trying to address this by citing people who spectate at these takeovers to give them $1,000 tickets because they are participating in it, too. They think this could cut down on some of that crime. But so many people, as we saw in that piece, so frustrated by this, Tom. All right, Stephen Romo. Steve, thanks for bringing us that story. When we come back, learning his fate, the man who attacked a Las Vegas judge last week, you remember, the high jumper? Well, this time, take a look. Back in court with a face mask, shackled and his hands covered, the delayed prison sentence that same judge just handed down. Welcome back. We are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed and the man who attacked a Las Vegas judge back in court today. The suspect appearing before that same judge in shackles, look at this, with a mask over his face and orange mittens on his hands. He was also surrounded by multiple officers. You may remember him from last week when he went airborne. He was caught on camera, lunging over a judge's bench, knocking her to the ground. That judge sentencing him today to four years in prison for a battery charge from a previous crime. 
Breaking news out of Washington right now. The Secret Service tells us someone crashed a car into a security fence at the White House complex. It happened on the Treasury building side. Secret Service has detained the driver. Luckily, there are no reports of injuries. An investigation is now ongoing. And a Florida man lucky to be alive after his catamaran caught fire. Take a look. New video shows the boat completely engulfed in flames just north of West Palm Beach. Officials say the boat operator managed to jump off with his dog and make it to shore just before the fire consumed the vessel. Luckily, no one was hurt here. Okay, we want to turn on to a miraculous helicopter rescue in Southern California. A woman surviving for five days while trapped in her car amid freezing temperatures. The heroic moment authorities came to her. NBC's Rahima Ellis has that story. Tonight, a miracle rescue. They have uh, one confirmed patient over the side. Conscious, the patient has been over the side since Wednesday. BDC and ANF personnel on scene making access to the patient will need to extract by copter. A woman trapped in her car for five days in frigid temperatures with no cell phone service. It's been extremely cold and wet, as we're all aware, with the, uh, the rain and the colder temperatures in the month of January. It happened in a remote section of Angeles National Forest near Mount Baldy. The woman told firefighters she swerved to avoid a deer in the road, her Ford Ranger plummeting more than 200 feet. She spent five days and four terrifying nights trapped in her car. Then a hiker spotted the wreck and flagged down firefighters who were on a separate rescue call in the area. She's lucky that somebody uh, was going for a hike and found her. And lucky to have survived and appears to have escaped the ordeal only slightly injured. Based on everything, it's going to be, uh, you know, elements, you know, hypothermic possibly, uh, dehydrated, malnourished, and uh, possible leg injury. Officials offering this incident as a warning about driving during these treacherous winter months. Uh, driving too fast for current conditions and, and not being familiar with the roadway is a big factor in a lot of the accidents, but her surviving it not only just the accident, but also the elements is a, a, a New Year's miracle. Rahima Ellis, NBC News. Okay, now the top stories, Global Watch, and a check of what else is happening around the world. A judge in Haiti issuing an arrest warrant for former heads of state over corruption. The warrant naming 30 high-ranking government officials, including two former presidents and four former prime ministers. They're accused of misappropriating funds or equipment for a government agency that builds roads and clears rubble, especially after natural disasters like earthquakes. Okay, five people have been rescued from a cave in Slovenia after being trapped since Saturday. Video shows rescuers pulling a man through neck deep water. Wow, look at that. To get him out today, officials say a family of three and two guides became trapped in the cave after heavy rainfall raised water levels too much. Rescuers managed to bring in food and heating and Saturday night, the group had been touring underground lakes in the area before getting stuck. And the prime minister of France resigning today ahead of an expected government overhaul. Elizabeth Bourne saying President Emmanuel Macron asked her to step down. Macron is expected to make major changes to his cabinet in 2024, a year France is set to hold at least two international events, including the Olympics. His current government facing major backlash over the passing of a controversial new immigration law and last year was met with widespread protest over pension reform. OK, when we come back, how far would you be willing to commute to save money on rent? Well, one Wall Street Journal reporter works in New York City but lives in Columbus, Ohio. We'll talk to him about making the choice to become a so-called super commuter and the tips and tricks he's learned along the way when it comes to travel that may help you save big bucks. Stay with us. All right, back now with a story that caught our eye in the Wall Street Journal. Chip Cutter, a reporter for the journal, detailing his life as a so-called super commuter. Here's what he does. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, but works in New York City. So how does he do it? He flies constantly and lives in a hotel three times a week. He thought he would be saving money on New York rent and seeing his family more, but it didn't exactly turn out as he planned. But he learned a lot, and that's why he's joining us tonight. Chip, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's, it's such an incredible sort of life. Um, you, you have to work in person in New York City, but you want to live in Ohio. Why? 
Well, I wanted to sort of be closer to my family there. I'm able to drive to see my parents. I can take a midweek walk with my sister. It's all pretty nice. The apartment is more than, you know, it's, it's half the cost of an apartment in New York City. So I kind of wondered, could I straddle these two worlds? Could I be in Columbus and then work in New York using everything I've learned over the years about using points and maximizing, you know, credit card bonuses and all that kind of stuff? And it's been a little comp more complicated than I might have thought. It, it wasn't as glamorous as you thought, right? Because when you did the math, you said, I'll save this money. I can use it to stay in hotels plus the points. But it didn't exactly work that way. Didn't work out. I mean, I, I had these visions of staying in this gorgeous hotel in lower Manhattan in a beautiful historic atrium. I'd wake up to a nice free breakfast, go off to work. And of course, we all know, like, deadlines come up. Something happens in the news business. All of a sudden, you might need to stay an extra night, another two nights. And you also, I didn't want to say no to friends who invited me to a birthday party, to someone who was in town for only one night. And so I ended up being here four or five nights a week. And so the math quickly stopped working. At the same time, though, I, there was a sense of adventure to this, of right. trying to kind of constantly be flying every week, getting up at 4.15 a.m. Yeah. Talk to me about that, like a typical day for you. Yeah. So I got it down to a science, where I'd wake up at 4.15. On Monday. On Monday. I'd get a flight at about 6 a.m. from Columbus, Ohio. The airport is glorious. There's almost never a line. And so you then, I could sometimes get it down to three hours, where you door to door from leaving my apartment to arriving in the newsroom at the journal three hours that's of course if everything goes right and it yeah. oftentimes didn't because of delays or weather or whatever it might be but it's not bad three hours is doable and then you're jumping around different hotels jumping around different hotels sometimes a different hotel every single week depending on what was the best price i would oftentimes hotel surf sort of property surf depending on what was the the best price that week obviously sometimes staying with friends uh and family members too but sometimes but, changing hotels midweek right week sometimes Sometimes a different, you'd stay at a Hampton one night, a budget hotel later in the week, a Hyatt out in a Jamaica, Queens, ended up being a place I stayed a lot only because it was a lot cheaper. Uh, but you can make this work. It is possible. It just takes some, some creativity. So you traveled so much. Give us some tips, right? What's, when's the best time, do you think, to book a flight or a hotel? Yeah, I would try. I actually found booking later ended up helping me. So not booking too far in advance what I, for flights in particular. Because oftentimes now, with no change fees on flights, you can reprice a flight multiple multiple times. So if the price goes down, you can benefit from that. So I would try not to go too far in advance. With hotels, what I found is that sometimes hotels, particularly in New York City, they, they do the same kind of dynamic pricing that you might see in the airline industry. So the prices might change a half dozen times in a single day. And so there were nights when I was waiting until 10 p.m. to actually pull the trigger and book a hotel. Because and why I just, 10 p.m.? Well, I just watched the price just go down, maybe $10, another $20, $30. You could see that almost in real time. You could see it in real wow. time just looking at some of these hotel apps. Uh, the, the, the apps that the hotels run themselves. And uh, and so then I'd finally just book a room after dinner and, and go off to the hotel. Any good tips on points, if people are trying to use points? Yes, yeah, so you need to sort of understand the value of points, whether it makes sense to use cash to book a trip or to use miles. Because I think sometimes people oftentimes waste their points. They, uh, you know, they, they, they should treat it sort of like cash, treat it as a currency, you need to know the value of it and try to make good decisions that way. And so you calculate basically this many points equal this fare, and you could kind of figure out, wow, this is way more points. That's exactly right. And there's, of course, a million frequent flyer blogs out there, mileage blogs to help people make sense of this. I read a lot of those, and I do find some of them to be helpful, but you kind of, you need to know the rules. You need do you to feel like you have to stick with one airline and one hotel to build those points? Absolutely. That, that's the key. For me, it was American Airlines and Hyatt. So I, I had 135 nights in a Hyatt last year. Wow. And and that that really helps that you end up starting to get some perks yeah. along the way. The hotel staff recognizes you. I'd go to some hotels. They wouldn't even ask for my ID in the mornings. They just sort of knew me and knew who I was. You know, you've stayed is such a variety of hotels. Is there anything to be said about hotel ratings? Do you trust them? I, I actually don't trust them as much. I mean, I try to just read as many as possible in a TripAdvisor review, for example. You're looking for the outliers. I mean, are there, are there, if there's just an occasional person who says the hotel is noisy or frustrating, okay, maybe not an issue. But if there's a lot of people who are consistently saying you can't get a good night's sleep at this property, I might be a little bit nervous. For me, staying at some of these places so often, you kind of learn locations in a hotel, too. So I would say I'd like a room ending in five please, because that was the room that overlooked like an interior courtyard that was a lot quieter. You, know, you would you start, look up and find, figure that out. You kind of figure that out. Okay. Some of the some hotel chains, they, they provide a floor map before yeah. you even check in. You can kind of get a better sense of what might be quieter. Before we go, because we're running out of time, did you save money and are you going to stay being a super commuter? So, didn't end up saving money. It kind of blew my budget by about 15%. Okay. But 
it was pretty, it was, there it was, was adventure, it was fun, and hotel rates look cheap again. So I'm not convinced. I, I think I might be able to do this a few months longer. Okay, so you're going to stay doing it. I think so. All right. A little bit. Chip Cutter, maybe the greatest name in news. We thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you sharing. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.